So welcome all to the plenary panel on women and work. We chose this topic this year because it was clearly topical. While more men than women have died from COVID-19 in the UK, women's well-being has been more negatively affected. During the first year of the pandemic, women reported higher levels of anxiety and loneliness than men. They were more likely to have been furloughed and they took on more unpaid domestic duties and took a significantly greater share of responsibility for childcare and homeschooling. Our annual conference seeks to place these characteristics in historical context. And this is what our plenary is doing this year. We have here three distinguished speakers and let me introduce them in a chronological order. Jane Whittle is Professor of Economic and Social History at Exeter University. She's author of numerous books and articles, including most recently, Consumption and Gender in the Early 17th Century Household, published in 2012. A Critique of Approaches to Domestic Work, Past and Present, 2019. And The Gender Division of Labor in Early Modern England, Economic History Review 2020. Jane currently holds a European Research Council advanced grant to study forms of labor, gender, freedom, and experience of work in the pre-industrial pre economy. So Jane, we see her here on the screen. Thank you very much for coming. Next, Emma Griffin. Emma is Professor of Modern British History at the University of East Anglia. She is the author of five books, most recently, Breadwinner, An Intimate History of the Victorian Economy, published in 2020. Emma is co-editor of the journal History. She's the president of the Royal Historical Society. So Emma, thank you very much for coming. Helen McCarthy, is reader of modern and contemporary British history at the University of Cambridge and a fellow of St. John's College. She is the author of three books, including Women of the World, The Rise of the Female Diplomat, 2014, and Double White Lives, A History of Working Motherhood, 2020. She's currently developing a new project on the socialist intellectual and writer, Beatrice Webb, and her biography, Margaret Cole. So Helen, thank you very much for coming. Our three speakers will speak in a chronological order. They have about 15 minutes each. And um, we will start therefore with Jane. You can use the chat for placing questions. I will field the questions and uh, Henry Irving, our communications officer, will help me just get them right and uh, communicate them to you. So Jane, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and for that lovely introduction. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here and be part of this discussion. Um, so I'm in this round table providing the context um, about women's work in the period before 1750, um, and particularly in early modern England. And just to give you um, a bit more context, I mean, Naomi's just mentioned some of the, the things that I've been working on recently. Um, so I've had two projects. So one was funded by the um, Leverhulme Trust on women's work in rural England, and currently I'm funded by the European Research Council. And both of these projects have been looking um, at women's work and trying out new methodologies for investigating women's work. Um, and I'm working towards, um, in fact, two books, one about the experience of work and one about um, how we conceptualize women's work. So in this research, I think I've been motivated by, by two key issues. Um, and I think it's helpful 
to think about these before I move on to discuss my research a bit. So one is um, the first issue is um, I would describe as a misunderstanding of women's traditional role. Now, I don't think this is a misunderstanding that many historians of women's work hold, but it is how um, women's work is conceived by the wider public. And um, as an example of this misunderstanding, I want to quote Gary Becker, Nobel Prize winning economist. Um, and he says, the most pervasive division of labor is between married women who've traditionally devoted most of their time to childbearing and other domestic activities and married men who have hunted, soldiered, farmed and engaged in other market activities. So this is the understanding that um, women are less involved in the economy than men because of um, childbearing and um, some amorphous other domestic activities, which we assume involves housework. Um, so that's one thing that I'm fighting against, that, that sort of misconception. The other is a, is a historical conundrum. And that is that on the one hand, almost any historical source, type of historical source that you look at, there's less evidence for women's work than there is for men's work. And yet the sources from the early modern period tell us that women worked just as hard, if not harder than men. Um, and we know this as well from modern time use studies of um, societies based on small scale agriculture, but women generally do more work than men, not less. So if that's the case, and where is, where is this women's work? How can we find out about it? So in doing this research, um, I've taken two approaches. So one is to think really carefully about the concepts we use. Um, and I don't mean kind of complicated theoretical constructs. I mean the basic language that we're using. So what is work? What does how do we define work? What is the economy? Well, perhaps the economy is more of a complicated concept, but some people assume it's self-evident. And, and I would say we have to think carefully about what it is. Um, and most recently, I've been writing an article about the housewife. So what does that word mean? And how has it been understood in different periods? How has it changed over time? So that's um, one of the approaches I'm taking. And the other approach is to develop new methodologies to um, get more information about the sources we know exist. So on the one hand, um, that's been, um, I've been working jointly with Mark Halewood um, on developing this technique of using evidence of work tasks recorded in, in court documents. So when people say that they're doing something um, we record that and, and the context around it, and then you can analyze it quantitatively. But the other approach I take um, is just to, um, is less kind of radical, but just returning to the classic sources we know and rereading them with a careful eye for those watching out for those kind of conceptual traps of, of not thinking carefully enough about what words mean. So I've been returning to looking at advice literature, for instance, and also wage accounts and looking at how wage accounts are recorded. So um, I've just selected kind of three main findings or arguments that um, have come out of this work that I wanted to kind of put into the discussion today. So the first is about how we understand the economy as a whole. Um, so early modern conceptions of the economy um, thought of it as an agglomeration of household economies. So the household was the, the heart of the economy and the economy as a whole was made up of just thousands of these household economies. This conception valued women's and men's contribution. However, things changed when Adam Smith redefined the economy as involving the production of goods, thus excluding services. 
and therefore a great deal of women's work. Paid services were reintroduced into conceptions of the economy in the late 19th century, but not unpaid services. And ironically, this was precisely at the time when women's work was becoming more concentrated on unpaid services for their own families. So today we consider unpaid childcare and housework as tasks which, were, which are outside the economy. So what I'm trying to say with this is that the idea of the economy has changed over time and it seems to have changed in ways that precisely exclude a large amount of women's work. So the second thing I wanted to, to stress um, is about the gender division of labour. Um, and if I was technically savvy enough to have managed to share my screen, which I tried earlier and it didn't work, I would have shown you this table, but I can just talk you through it anyway. Um, so from the evidence we collected about work tasks um, in Southwest England between 1500 and 1700, we were able to recruit the gender division of labour. And what this showed um, was that there are differences in the patterns of men's work and the patterns of women's work, and they are the differences that we would expect. So men did more work in agriculture, more work in crafts and construction, more work in transport than women, and women did more care work and housework than men. But on the other hand, the reconstructed gender division of labour also showed that women did an enormous amount of agricultural work, just not quite as much as men did, and that agriculture was an important um, type of work for them as, for instance, housework was. It came out about the same percentage, about 20% of work tasks done by women. Um, and also that there were many areas of the economy, such as commerce, food processing, and management where men's and women's contribution was almost exactly equal. So I think for years, historians have grappled with a gender division of labor and the issue is, but it is significant. There are significant differences in the, between historically between the type of work that men have done and women have done. But at the same time, it was quite flexible and there was a lot of overlap. Um, and this has led uh, to confusion. Um, and it's important to stress from that, um, that in our data, if you add the, the kind of care work and the housework together in women's work repertoires, it's about 30% of the work they're doing. The other 70% is other types of work. So the, final finding I wanted to stress is about the housewife. So this is what I've been working on recently. And this is just to say that the word housewife, which was originally huswif in the medieval period, it meant the female counterpart of the husband. And both these words had the hus element, which meant house. And it referred to them being heads of household. Well, originally the, the with element in the housewife meant woman, it didn't mean wife, it meant woman. Well, bond in husband meant peasant. So neither word actually implied marriage. Advice literature from the 16th to 18th centuries addressed to housewives outlined tasks such as making medicines, raising livestock, dairying, distilling and brewing. It did not describe um, how to clean your house, although it did sometimes tell you how to do laundry, which was more complex. Housework, meaning cleaning and tidying your house, only emerges as a term in the late 18th century. So housewife is a medieval word, but housework um, only appears in the late 18th century. And the modern definition of a housewife is a married woman who does not work and is primary, as in does not work, does not do paid work and is primarily occupied in providing unpaid housework and care work for her immediate family. That definition only really solidifies in the early 20th century. And I think it's deeply ironic that people regard this as women's traditional role 
when it's actually um, really a late 19th and early 20th century construction. So um, just to tie up um, my discussion, things I'd really like to discuss um, with Emma and Helen um, and everyone else who's here. And um, first is the definition of work. So I've been using um, the definition provided by Margaret Reed, the economist um, who wrote a book called The Economics of Household Production published in 1934. And she argued that as well as paid activities, unpaid activities, which could be replaced by market goods, such as purchased goods or paid services, should all be considered as work and therefore part of the economy. Is this definition adequate or is it problematic? I'd love to know what you think. Um, secondly, if we redefine women's traditional role as a housewife in the way that I've just outlined, um, so that traditionally housewives were involved in agriculture, food processing, marketing, textile production, medicine, and business management, as well as childcare and housework. How does that reshape how we think about women in the 19th and 20th centuries? And finally, um, given the evidence from modern time use studies globally show that all in all types of economy, women work longer hours than men. How is it that we still have the kind of overriding assumption that men's contribution is more economically significant? How can we kind of challenge that? Thank you, that's my contribution. Thank you. I'll just uh, roll straight on, shall I? I'd like to just add my um, thanks for being invited. Um, it's a wonderful session to be part of and lovely to be here with Jane and Helen and a lovely way to start the session, um, seeing the people winning their prizes and hearing about that work. So well done. Well done, everybody there. OK, so I'm taking the story forward. Um, um, I look at the uh, my work starts really in the 18th century, so kind of starts a little bit later, a little space between uh, where Jane finishes and where I have been starting traditionally. But what I wanted to do today is um, talk about how I've been trying to think about women's work over that period and particularly around that kind of that, that special moment of the Industrial Revolution. So I will share my screen. Um, I have a few slides, not loads, um, but we will do that and we will start here. So I've been, um, oh, I can't do the. Um, Sorry, everybody. Okay, right. So I've been looking at working class autobiographies. Um, they come on stream in the 18th century, but not in any great number. And they particularly start to shed light all through that period of the um, late 18th century and then through the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution, and then kind of well into the Victorian and the Edwardian period. We have kind of an abundance of these sources and an ever growing number of them. When we're looking at that early period, that period of kind of the most um, dramatic change, the Industrial Revolution, most of the sources are written by men. Um, I've got an example here of William Lovett, for example. They're not only written by men, they tend to be written by men uh, in this early period who went on and did something, just as William Lovett obviously became a significant in the Chartist movement. And I certainly do have, in addition, autobiographies written by people. This is somebody um, from Norfolk who wrote a handwritten autobiography that's still in the record office um, at Norfolk. Um, he doesn't become a big name, his name is John Lincoln. He's not um, in the same sphere as um, William Lovett, but he's still got a kind of story of a man who does something with his life. That's partly why the source is created. What is very nice as we move through the 19th century down to the kind of the end, you know, the tail end of the 19th century and the early Edwardian period, we do start to get much more sources written by women. Um, so we can start to say something about their experiences and lives and perspectives from about the 1880s, the 1890s, that generation is really where their women's writing is starting to emerge. And this um, slide here, um, the one that's on the left of my screen with, uh, with the people, this is Maggie Newbury sitting in the middle with her large number of brothers and sisters. 
um, and Edith Pratt, um, she's a domestic servant when this um, photograph is taken, she's used her wages to go off and get a nice studio photograph taken of herself um, in the early 20th century. But that earlier period, the evidence is really quite scant. And what you have is autobiographies that are written by men, um, but men have mothers and they have wives and they have sisters. So a lot of what I'm doing for this earlier period is just trying to, to, to see what the men are writing about the women's in their life, particularly with respect to work. And that's difficult because many of the men who are writing their autobiographies, and I think it, it ties up with, with a point that Jane made, they, they don't actually highly privilege or value women's work and particularly a later looking back it's not the is it the wife's work or the mother's work is not the thing of significance in their life story and it doesn't get very much of a space um, I um, found particularly frustrating um, the autobiography by Alison Alexander Muirston now he had actually written quite a lot about his wife's work but the autobiography was then edited by his son and his son explained in the introduction that there was too much stuff in the autobiography and he'd taken it out and replaced it with dots where there was unnecessary detail. And that's always, he's just about, you see Alexander is just about to say something about what his wife was doing. And that's where the dots emerge. So that's all, all, what had been edited out by the sun in effect. And even in this early period, even when you have autobiographies that are written by women, you have very few at this time, they don't tell you very much about their work. It's an incidental detail. It's not the story of their autobiography at all. So um, Margaret Davidson, for example, I know that she worked because she describes how she used to uh, sit and spin with somebody. But the point of the story is that this uh, friend's father had tried to rape her. So it is nothing to do with the spinning. It's a completely accidental detail that just manages to get um, put into the autobiography in some way. And that's far from being unusual. Anyway, well, this is the evidence. What can we find out about women and work? And particularly, can we say something about how it start, you know, how it, how it's changing as the as the country industrializes and as it urbanizes, modernizes? Can we say something different about the work um, that Jane describes for the earlier period, for example? Well, one of the things I did was just take these autobiographies during this industrial revolution period and just try and just just note what the mother, what the women are doing. Uh, several women mentioned what are they all doing, um, and when I did that, it was apparent that most of the work that women, there's definitely a wide variety of tasks, but you can kind of categorise them into five areas. There's very little evidence of women working outside these five areas. So the first one, obviously, is the textiles. That could be very humble spinning. By the later period, it could be working in a factory. So there's a great range of different things that women are doing, um, but a lot of it can be rooted back to textile work in some way or another. In addition to that, what do we have? We have um, agriculture. It's the next big thing that gets mentioned lots. There's uh, women with their potatoes here. And um, this is quite a staged photo from the end of the 19th century um, where you've got a woman doing hop picking with her partner and the baby has gone out of the fields with them. Um, so second most important, I mean, the textiles is the biggest single category. Agriculture is the next single biggest tag category. And I think this image as well shows it, as, the, as do the potatoes. When women say they're working in agriculture, that almost always means they do some agricultural tasks at some point during the year. Not that they are working consistently as a labourer the whole period, but there will be moments when they are out in the fields, getting potatoes, picking hops, doing a bit of planting, whatever it might be. It will be local to the, local to the region. Beyond that, we can group a lot of what women are doing um, as some form of service. So I rather like this image that I found on the left of these washerwomen. I mean, this could, again, could be a wide variety of things. It's, it's some form of work, um, doing some form of domestic work and getting paid for it for other people. So on the left, we've got women who are bringing in laundry um, and doing laundry in their backyards. You've got their laundry pails there. Um, and the flapping laundry at the front of the photograph. Um, and we've got um, Hannah Culver, that's a staged photograph of her by Mundy, um, doing uh, work as a kind of a classic domestic servant. There's a whole range of different ways in which women pick up other households' um, domestic work for them and get a little bit of money for it. Next in importance is the old retailing. Um, again, this is this can you know, all of these things. There could be a great range of what we're looking at. It could be a, a woman who's got a house 
in her shop and she has it for a number of years and she works every day and it's a very major undertaking or it could well be something like a bit of street selling we've got here so the autobiographer could be referring to a mother who falls on hard times and does a little bit of hawking and it's a discreet short window of their life rather than something that's um, ongoing and permanent um, and there's a genteel form of trading and there's much uh, less genteel forms of trading like the, the street selling. And then last um, in importance is needlework. Most of the needlework is being done within the home, um, but there are also some women going out to work in various forms of workshops and sweatshops, but so by the later 19th century um, and working in those kinds of environments instead. So those really, I will stop the screen share. Don't need it anymore. Um, so those really are the um, major forms of employment that women are engaged in and women are involved in all through this period. It's very often um, with all low paid work, it's all low paid and very often it's seasonal and it's temporary. And that's really the hallmarks of the things that I see women doing in the autobiographies during this period. Um, the work is nearly always unskilled and I, I guess I throw that into that um, category of terms that we should think about um, that Jane has mentioned when I look at the, I mean some of the work is skilled um, and skill is clearly a word that's applied to certain forms of labour and it, it tends to be applied to the, to the work that men do so I've got examples from the late 19th century for example where you've got a factory um, that the women are doing some of the work and the men are doing some of the work and it's really impossible from an outsider's point of view to see which is the difficult which is clever and which is important but some of it is labelled skilled and some of it is labelled unskilled and the women are always doing the unskilled and the men are always doing the skilled and then when the war um, starts and the men go off the women are redeployed uh, to the skilled work it turns out the women can do it absolutely fine um, so I, I'm very skeptical about what work the word skill does for us I think it's a really gendered term and, and in lots of ways not very helpful but it's certainly re re reviewed and regarded reviewed and regarded women's work is regarded as being unskilled and there's very little what is very evident is there's very little evidence of women um, doing apprenticeships or trying to skill up um, and, and trying to gain a skill that they will use in the marketplace whereas the male autobiographies are full of this all the way through trying to learn skills trying to improve trying to get some marketable um, employment skill the women don't do that and in my autobiographies I actually had just one I felt was really clearly trying to better herself through paid work and that was Eliza Mitchell um, and she'd been working as a domestic servant and this is all the story that's told in great detail quite usually by her husband um, that she thought she would like to learn a trade he says um, instead of doing service and she spent two years living with her aunt and learning the little fancy shoe making for little children and this is a collection um, of well over 300 autobiographies um, during this period of industrialization um, and she's really the only one I find the only woman I found who tries to better herself um, and, and make some kind of improvement in her, her position through paid work. For other women, you improve your situation effectively by marriage or something, uh, marriage, but hooking up with a man, in, a male breadwinner in some form or another. So that was one of the things, now I've got a few minutes left. The other thing I just want to mention is um, how much work is being done. As I say, it's a really difficult question because how much, um, you know, these jobs are not permanent jobs. They're not equivalent to the way that men are engaging in the workplace at all. But if I just put in all of the autobiographers and all the mentions of women's work, I come up with a figure that about 33% of the autobiographers mention that their mother um, was working, uh, doing some form of paid work, which could be a permanent job or much more often was some kind of dipping in and out of the uh, labour market. Um, and I think that's something of a surprise, because when you look at the, the employment of children, you notice that with the coming of industrialization, with the coming of the factories, there's a real demand for labor. The economy needs workers and children are being hustled very clearly. And this is shown in other people's work on child labor as well. Children are being hustled into the economy at ever large younger ages because there's a real need for labor. And there's a real benefit for men as well. They are also getting much more opportunities to better themselves and improve themselves through work. And yet with women, the figure really doesn't change very much. It hovers around a third. And it doesn't matter whether you're looking at an industrial area where there's loads of work available for women or whether you're out in the countryside where there's no change, make any difference. And women are still kind of participating in the labor market um, in a relatively low level. And in fact, the 
headline figure for participation is always higher in rural areas all through the 19th century down to the First World War. You've always got a bit more like 40%, 45% of women um, in the countryside are doing some work um, and in the towns it's always lower. And, and, and it's a bit of a conundrum because that's kind of where the industrial revolution is happening. It's not creating a lot of work for women. When you scrape away and look at it a little bit more closely, what, what I think is happening is it's clear they do have demand for labour. And so long as women are unmarried, um, women are also entering the workplace and they're earning quite good wages in ways that are similar. You know, by their late teens, they're earning relatively good wages. Um, but what's also happening is as soon as they marry, or actually much more important than the marriage is the, the bearing of children, as soon as women begin to bear children, they retreat from the working place, from, from the workplace. And you can see this very clearly in the autobiographies. If you look at, um, I mean, even my lovely um, Eliza Mitchell, for example, a classic example, she does all that work to better herself. She marries, she has a child. First of all, she keeps on working. She has a second child. She still carries on with her fancy shoe business. But as the family starts to grow and she gets more and more children, it becomes impossible for her to continue doing this. And it's not really marriage, it's the coming, it's the arrival of the children within marriage that's pulling women out. And you can see it quite clearly in the numbers. In married couples with just one child um, or with no child, over 80% of mothers or wives are working. It's actually quite high. Um, and when there are just two children, you've got 70% that are doing some kind of form of paid work. And then once you reach three or four children, that's where women stop working and start to withdraw from the labour market altogether. And the bigger the family gets, the more they retreat. By the time you've got six and seven children, very, very little evidence of women doing any paid work. And then just quite interesting, if you've got these really large families, which are not very common, but when you get to 10 or 12 children, and you've got lots of older daughters who can do the housework, then sometimes you do see the mother out in the workplace again. So um, I won't speak for an awful lot longer. Um, I think there's just a couple of other points that I would like to make about um, the figures here. I think it was worth underlining again that there's something that's changing. There's clearly something that's changing with the Industrial Revolution. There is more work available. Um, and yet there are things that don't change. The reality of bearing children and raising children is like an immovable force all through our period. You don't really have a decline in family size that's very marked down to the beginning of the First World War. So women's lives tend to be dominated by um, pregnancy, uh, childbirth and childcare. And this is much more significant for women than the story of the Industrial Revolution is, which appears in certain moments, um, particularly if you're childless and you're living in Lancashire. But if you're not in that category, uh, the, the reality of being a woman um, and having children is going to be more significant for you than these other big changes that we seem to always think are the really important ones. And just one other uh, thing to add to that and something else that comes out through the autobiography through this period is there's a reluctance um, there seems to be a reluctance on the part of women to enter the work, work uh, enter the labour market after they've got children to look after. And this becomes even clearer. I mean, there's, there's evidence, there's lots of, there's, there's, there's men moaning about their wives working in the earlier set of autobiographies that are largely written by men. We don't, as I say, we don't really have women talk about their experiences for that period. But men seem to not like it. They seem to think that there's enough for the wife to do and everybody's standard of living is enhanced if she stays at home and does it than if she tries to complicate their lives by earning a little bit of extra income that seems to be the story that's coming out and when the women's voices come on stream after about 1860 1870 1880 we start to get much more autobiographies that are written by women and much fuller accounts of women's lives that really seems to be um, corroborated and supported again and you get more detail around this now that any paid work that women do is additional to all of the work that needs to be done in the house. And there's often a large number of children, but there's also, particularly if you're out in the countryside, there's the fetching of the water, there's the chopping of the wood. Um, wherever you live, you're, you've got no refrigeration. So meals, dirty, unprocessed food is purchased on a daily ba basis and transformed into some form of ed edible meal. And it's really, really hard work. And there seems to be a very strong feeling um, on all parts inside the kind of the, the marriage partnership um, that everybody's standard of living is improved if a woman is able to do that rather than to go out and to be doing 
the housework as well. So just a few concluding points then. Um, for me, it seems that women um, experience the Industrial Revolution in ways that are very different um, to the ways it's experienced by their husbands and their sons. All this massive economic growth and expansion that's been so well documented, there's a real evidence of continuity in women's lives. Even in the factory districts where women do engage, obviously, in, in, in paid labour outside the factory work, um, it tends to be transitory. Towns offer a lot more, not, I mean, all towns, not just the factory towns, they offer things like dressmaking, laundry work, charring, but it's all low paid and it's all done in addition to the work that women will have to do for her own family anyway. So it's not an enticing prospect to add that. Um, all in all, I think it's very unsurprising that women's employment changes so little and also how this, this endures well down to 1914. There's no real change even as the kind of the century progresses. The Industrial Revolution was undoubtedly a time of economic opportunity, but the weight of existing social structures and cultural expectations seemed to keep women firmly shut out of valuable um, and useful high paid um, economic work. Thank you. Okay, well, shall I, I will jump straight in then. Um, and uh, I will, I must echo um, Emma and Jane in thanking the Social History Society for the invitation to speak at this, uh, this plenary. Um, it was really lovely to receive the invitation and what a great topic. Um, so what I'm gonna do in my 15 minutes is talk about my uh, most recent book, uh, Double Lives, A History of Working Motherhood, which was published last year. Um, but I'm not gonna try to sort of summarize its key themes and arguments. I'll just give you a little flavor of those. Uh, but instead, I'm going to try to draw out the key aspects of my approach to doing the history of working motherhood and some of the key challenges that I faced as a historian of women's paid work. Um, and then at the end, I'll sort of reflect very briefly on why doing the history of women's work might be important now. OK, I am going to share my screen. I've got a little slideshow. OK, here we go. Um... started um, right I can't actually make it move. okay mm. there we go got there in the end okay so double lives then is a social and cultural history of working motherhood uh, in Britain since around the mid-19th century up to pretty much the present day um, my aim was to provide um, a continuous narrative account of change and continuity in the lives of mothers who worked for pay over this period. And I wanted to cast my net quite widely, looking at women across social classes, across occupations, across ethnicities, across regions. I wanted to look at married mothers, unmarried mothers, widowed mothers, divorced mothers. Um, and I also wanted to write a book which might attract um, a general readership as well as an academic one. Now, of course, I'm not claiming that motherhood and wage, earn wage earning is in any way a neglected theme. Uh, there is, a, as we all know, a massive historical literature on women's paid work in Britain uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries, much of which looks very closely at the relationship between reproductive labor in the family and women's productive labor uh, in the economy. But if you dig into the more recent scholarship, one tends to find that the work which brings the lives of mothers into the sharpest focus uh, tends to cover relatively short periods or to look at regional or occupational case studies. And there's also a particular dearth of scholarship of historical scholarship uh, on the period since the 1970s, which is really when uh, the sociologists and the economists and the feminist geographers take over. Um, so Double Lives tries to paint uh, on quite a broad canvas. Uh, and with a subject like working motherhood, I knew that I had to make choices about what sorts of questions to ask and which research strategies to pursue. Um, and my foundation for this was, of course, the massive, brilliant scholarship produced by economic historians, historians of demography, historians of the family, historians of women, historians of gender, all the wonderful historians who belong to the Social History Society, in fact. Um, but the conceptualization of the book was particularly influenced by two loosely grouped bodies of literature. And I just want to say something briefly um, about those. 
So the first is the now, uh, I would say classic, uh, feminist historiography on women's work in the two world wars produced by historians such as Deborah Tom, Denise Riley, and uh, Penny Summerfield, who I think may be here. Uh, and if you know that literature, as I'm sure many of you uh, in the Zoom room will know, um, you'll know that what those historians did in the 1980s and 1990s was to pose critical questions about how women's subjective experience as both workers and mothers was represented, interpreted, and made culturally intelligible at these formative moments in 1918 and 1945 in the making of the social and political order. And I would also add to that list Susan Peterson's early work on the gendering of the welfare state, which really helped me to think uh, about how uh, particular claims about the family and its needs became ideologically entrenched in the 20th century and how other analyses which might prize women apart from the family were shut down or marginalized in the process. The second group of scholars who have really influenced me um, are those who've been recently working with social science archives or, or adopting social science as a lens through which to rethink narratives of social change uh, in Britain, particularly since the 1940s. And some of the most prominent work has been produced by uh, John Lawrence, Lena Todd, James Hinton, Claire Langhammer, Florence Sutcliffe Braithwaite, and there are many, many others. But I would particularly um, single out the 2010 book by the sociologist Mike Savage, Social Identities and Social Change in Britain which in very simplified terms argues that around the mid 20th century, social scientists stopped investigating social problems and started exploring ordinary everyday lives. And in so doing reshaped the categories and narratives with which people made sense of social change. And I read this book at quite an early point uh, in my project and it helped me to devise some interpretive strategies for dealing with a large body of source material on women's paid work, which I'd begun to explore. And all of which I realized uh, in one way or another was the product of, or was in conversation with different modes of social investigation, social research and social scientific expertise. You know, right from the social investigation of Victorian reformers up to the popular sociology of the 1960s and beyond. Um, and this body of material, which really forms the main source base um, for Double Lives, gave me a lens through which to think about the whole period in a way which um, I would argue perhaps has not been done before. So building on and trying to push beyond these bodies of scholarship then led me to a set of research questions which hinge around the idea of knowledge formation and claim making about women's paid work. So this is really where I'm sort of the cultural historian, the cultural and social historian. Um, what was it possible to think, say or write about mothers who worked for pay at different moments in time? What sorts of claims could be made about the effects of their wage earning on the family, society and economy? Which claims were most consequential when it came to policymaking, employment practices and women's own strategies for getting by or getting on? And to what extent were mothers able to narrate their own subjective experiences of working for pay and to define their own needs and desires regarding work and the family? And thinking about and trying to answer those questions led me to develop uh, an interpretation which is encapsulated in the book uh, and which posits that a major cultural transformation took place in the meaning of working motherhood over the 20th century. Uh, and in short, I argue that whilst wage earning by mothers was a common phenomenon from the beginning of my period, it was only from the 1950s and 1960s that working motherhood began to acquire the status of a social norm. And what I'm really trying to explain in my book is how, when, and why the working mother became recognized as an ordinary and permanent feature of, of British society, as opposed to a social and economic problem. So I'm not gonna use the rest of my time to sort of flesh out this argument in any detail, although I'm very sort of happy to do so uh, in, in the discussion. Um, instead, I want to make some more general reflections on what it might mean to do the history of women's work, which I think should connect 
rather nicely to some of the questions and themes already raised in Emma uh, and Jane's presentations. So the first uh, thorny issue, which um, Jane sort of framed really brilliantly for us, is work. What do we mean by this category when we study it as historians? And what do we mean by it when we study women's work? And I was conscious from the outset that my usage of the term working motherhood was in certain respects deeply problematic. Um, and I, I use it in the title of my book um, because it has a very clear, if nonetheless contested contemporary meaning, mothers who work for pay. Um, and as I said, I did want this book to sort of reach a broader audience. So that's why I sort of use the term working motherhood. But as a term, it was not used much before the mid 20th century. Uh, in, the mid, in the 19th century, married women's labor or married women's employment was more common with married women often being used as a proxy for mothers, although not always. Um, and this term, and again, this is very much connecting with, um, with Emma's um, comments, um, this term married women's work, I think alerts us to the significance of marital and maternal status and how they work together in debates about women's paid work uh, in that era. Wage earning mothers was a more precise formulation that we do find in the Victorian sources, um, particularly in relation to debates about infant mortality. In the vernacular, women talk about going out to mean going out to work for wages with stopping in, meaning not going out to work for wages, but it might, stopping in might uh, nonetheless cover paid work performed at home. Um, there were possibly hundreds of thousands of mothers working for pay in their own dwellings, often doing low paid piecework. So home working mothers complicates the picture further, as do wives running or helping to run family businesses. And you know, again, in the vernacular, they might be known as the landlady, the proprietress, or simply the mistress. Uh, and we know how unreliably the census records these kinds of economic activities. So there's an issue there about the terminology of women's paid work, how we historicize past usages and how we adopt or adapt them for our own analytical purposes. In Double Lives, I used a fairly inclusive approach by identifying working mothers as mothers who did any kind of work in exchange for pay, including regular employment and self-employment, full and part-time work, uh, and all of those seasonal, casualized, intermittent forms of earning that Emma was just describing to us. Uh, I try to locate those different kinds of paid work in the wider context of women's economic activities, saving and spending for the household. In some cases, investing and speculating for the family. And I'm drew here on the work of Jeanette Rutterford and, and Josephine Maltby and others who've been working uh, on, on uh, women as investors. Um, I also tried to place paid work alongside women's involvement in voluntary work, in charity and within working class communities, mutual aid. And finally, of course, my central concern in this book was to explore the relationship between paid work in all its forms and the embodied work of mothering itself, pregnancy, childbirth, nursing, infant care uh, and other forms of care, including elder care. And I fully confess that my research is empirically driven um, rather than theory driven. But I would like to just make one brief reflection on the theoretical implications of my approach, prompted in part actually by an exchange that I had just last year, just last week uh, with a feminist economist uh, who was listening to a talk that I was giving to uh, another conference. And she asked me whether um, by drawing lines analytically between paid work and motherhood, I was in danger of inadvertently naturalizing those categories. That is to say, you know, could I stand accused of simply seeking to slot mothers in to a conventional picture of economically productive labor in which the full-time male worker stands as the norm? And the problem of course with doing that is that mothers then appear as deviant and deficient as workers, whilst the socially reproductive labor of childcare and housework is left unaccounted for, as it has been within mainstream economics uh, since Adam Smith, again, as Jane told us earlier. Now, I hope that my book doesn't fall into that trap, although I fully admit it is not a work of feminist economic theory. Studying women's work, however you do it, I would suggest always sort of tends to lead you towards critique 
of dominant conceptualizations or periodizations or explanatory paradigms. You know, I'm very struck by what Emma was saying that actually the history of women's work makes one think rather differently about the periodization of the industrial revolution. Um, this feminist economist challenge uh, did, however, press me to think in a rather more focused way about the centrality of paid work in modern British history. One could call Britain a work society in which citizenship has, be has become predicated on labour market participation by men and the servicing of those who participate in labour markets by women. I mean, we find this ideology in all sorts of places, uh, the trade union movement, the Labour Party, late Victorian philanthropy, debates over the extension of the suffrage. Uh, and it has clearly been the logic underpinning Britain's liberal welfare regime in the 20th century, which institutionalized the male duty to provide for dependents. And Double Lives is, in this sense, a history of how mothers navigated this work society, how they developed strategies of survival, how they fought for equal rights as workers, how they made claims on the wage as a source of financial independence and status within and beyond the family. And telling that story of struggle is important, but it requires us to historicize, not naturalize, the ideological environment in which that struggle took place. And that was one in which paid work in the formal economy was accorded higher status than other kinds of labor. And I think if I was starting again, I might try to draw that lesson out more explicitly in my book. And I think it addresses one of those questions that Jane posed to us, which is, you know, what changes in the 19th and 20th century? Um, I would also, and this is my final point, uh, reframe some of my concerns in light of the current pandemic, um, what it has done to women's working lives and what it, what it has laid bare in our society, as, as Naomi suggested in her intro to this plenary at the beginning. Um, in Double Lives, I do take very seriously early 20th century feminist voices, which argued for alternative solutions to women's economic dependency within families. So Eleanor Rathbone is probably the most famous voice here. Uh, she didn't see wage earning by mothers as the answer to the problem of economic dependency. She thought that state endowment of motherhood was the answer. And there's a strand of feminist thought which develops that idea through the later 20th century, uh, through wages for housework and the domestic labor debate within socialist Marxist feminist circles. And I reference this strand of thought in my book to show that even feminists never agreed that paid work was emancipatory for all mothers in all places and at all times. But I think now I would seek to push that point further. I might reframe my story as less a struggle by mothers to claim access to the labor market and have that claim recognized as legitimate, and instead more as a historical critique of Britain as a work society centered on lives for whom that society never worked. The past 18 months have taught us that lesson, I think with painful clarity. When we remember how last March, our government at a stroke withdrew all forms of childcare without giving a moment's thought to the burden this would place on women. When we consider the mountain of research showing how mothers have disproportionately shouldered that burden, often at the expense of their careers, certainly at the, ex at the expense of their mental health. When we note the low priority given to rebuilding Britain's woefully underfunded childcare infrastructure in all government references to post-COVID recovery. When we read that the furlough scheme has protected full-time jobs whilst employers shed their part-timers, jobs overwhelmingly done by older women with caring responsibilities. When we recognize how those caring responsibilities remain undervalued, even during a crisis in which care has become absolutely central to our lives, care of children, care of the vulnerable elderly, care of those sick with COVID in hospital. When we confront all these facts, it seems to me that the history of working motherhood and the history of women's work more broadly is a history that we really need. We've always needed it. Uh, but we've never needed it more than now. And I'm just going to leave you with some images from uh, the National Portrait Gallery's community photography project called Hold Still, where they asked people all over Britain to send in their images of life during the pandemic in 2020, and then they picked the best 100, the top 100. And so many of those 100 images are images of care, 
their images of work, their images of care as work, their images of work as care, and their images in which women are caring and women are working. Um, and I think these are the images we need to keep in mind when we look back at COVID and the pandemic, not images of number 10 Downing Street press, uh, press conferences or uh, ministers getting up to various things in their offices. I think these are the images that we need to remember. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for a fascinating panel, amazing presentation. Thank you so much. Um, it's been really interesting and, and for me eye-opening to hear uh, these different views about um, concepts and uh, different materials and questions that go through time, uh, definitions that we must um, probe. So I'd like to thank the audience for coming. And thank you so much, our three speakers, uh, Jane Whittle, Emma Griffin, and um, Helen MacArthur. You've been absolutely amazing. And it's been a real pleasure to host you here in the plenary of our Social History Society Conference. Thanks very much. <laughs>